Where did the floor of Leipzig's city hall go? Was there a worldwide mud flood about 200 years ago? If yes, then why is this unknown? A mystery in a class of its own. It is a well-known phenomenon that solid ground can liquefy within seconds, for example, after an earthquake. Liquefaction has left much of the city a soggy, crumbled mess. But the, the liquefaction, I mean, the, 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 the suburban streets are like rivers. And you see these ladies over here, uh, you, they're just sinking. The silty, saturated layers of soil just below Christchurch were so severely shaken, they liquefied and with much easier. Entire villages can simply disappear within seconds. Sporadic mud floods, which bury everything beneath them, are well known. It can look like this. So, in itself, it is nothing special to expect that some houses have their first floors buried as we see this consistently in cities all over the world. In 2017, I stumbled across images like these, of which there are countless. Construction work reveals that what is now the basement must once have been the first floor. Due to an historically unrecorded event, towns were likely buried under masses of mud and the surviving inhabitants probably decided to convert the second floor into the first floor the upper part of the original first floor windows became what we now interpret as basement windows. If this is true, there should be large windows in today's basements that have since been bricked up, right? Voila! Clearly, there were once large windows here, but how did they get there? After all, no one would put large windows below street level, especially not 100 years ago, because basements were supposed to be dark for storing potatoes and other vegetables. Besides, dirt would easily blow in. Well, how come then that in Leipzig, for example, there are lots of large windows below street level? For example, this one in Reimenstraub. What we can find in abundance are houses with elevated entrances that also have a so-called lower level, like this one. Here are a couple of wonderful shots from Gdansk, summer of 2018, apparently full of basements. Or isn't it more likely that the former first floor is buried in the ground? Here's an interesting example from Denmark. The architects apparently built it for dwarfs. Why do they put these living areas half below street level instead of simply building at ground level? Three reasons speak against this construction method. One, you can't build a basement below the buried floor because they would need at least some air supply. Two, the apartments will be damp because they are half underground. Three, and last, but not least, it is more cumbersome because you have to excavate the space around the entrance, stairs and doors and always build external stairs. So either the architects didn't understand their craft 
or One architect suggested the reason was due to construction laws, which specified a maximum building height. The idea goes like this. Because they wanted to rent out as much as possible within the limits of what was allowed, i.e. for financial reasons, they built humid half-basement floors into which they moved the servants, as anyone else would hardly want to live there in times without central heating. A nice argument but probably more of a desperate attempt to ignore the whole issue. In the past, servants were always housed invisibly, for example, in the attic. Besides, did the obviously wealthy builders of those mansions really need a little extra income? And why spoil the appearance of the often nobly decorated building facades with dirty windows on the half-basement floor? And if aesthetics obviously played a major role, why build stairs in front of windows? I know dozens of examples of such unusual architectural planning in my hometown of Leipzig, alone. It seems more likely to me that the stairs were added later. Last but not least, one can ask why even a mega building like the so-called New City Hall in Leipzig, with its tower at almost 377 feet high has exactly the same mud flood characteristics. There as well we see large windows up to six feet below street level. Why was it urgent to add 20 more rooms and because of the ordinance issued by the city council itself, going underground was the only way. But then why build large windows when there is hardly any light anyway? I found what I was looking for in researching the old city hall in Leipzig, which shows another floor until 1600. Or even until 1830, if I interpret the corresponding picture correctly. Now, of course, the painter of 1593 could have been confused, but if the image analysis does not deceive me, the city hall was still higher in 1830. In 1900, one floor is missing. If we go by these photographs, which consistently show a higher city hall, the level of Leipzig's marketplace must be an entire floor higher today. So, did the entire city sink because the ground liquefied during an earthquake? That is not a possibility, because then many of the buildings would be crooked and full of cracks. But where could such big amounts of earth come from? We can't answer this question yet. But the phenomenon of missing floors and half basements remains. Who builds large windows deep underground? Can the old buildings be dated to the German Grundeszeit, comparable to the American Gilded Age, around 1900, or are they much older? What's the true history of underground cities that come to light everywhere? As already described, according to the photo comparison, for example at the old city hall of Leipzig, not only a complete floor is missing, but also the half basements at the Gilded Age buildings are peculiar. Buried first floors not only spoil the appearance, but also cause many other problems, such as moisture in the apartment. But because you can't just walk into these houses and examine the basements, I came up with another idea. I looked into the light wells and I was left breathless. Nowadays, light wells are no more than three feet deep and the windows are usually small because large ones would constantly get filthy. 
But in many of the old buildings I examined, it goes down really deep. Example, at the building near the new city hall in Leipzig, which today houses the Deutsche Bank, here's my first find, one of many. Who actually builds a large window whose upper edge is six foot below street level and shafts of a total of 16 feet into the depth. Why would you want to collect as much dirt as possible? This is how it looks today. The light well is on the corner to the left of the tree. Supposedly the building was built in just three years, starting in 1898, but it looked ancient back then. Quite strange. Another interesting photo, not far from the Nikolai Kirch, in a narrow backyard, one of the light shafts shows the following. The window, which starts at a depth of around three feet, not only has curtains, but there is another opening underneath, possibly a door. Why would anyone build a door and a window two stories deep into the ground? For accessing groundwater? What is puzzling? is why the lower opening was not at least simply buried, but the light well was built to this depth. Does anyone live in such dark depths? What a mystery. A good overview of the mud flood topic is given here. Wenn man die Straßen aufreißt, um Gebäude wieder dicht zu machen oder neue Leitungen zu verlegen, entdeckt man besonders in Russland, dass die Gebäude viel, viel tiefer gehen als die Straße, die bisher den Grund der Stadt Dokumentation von Joachim Zilmer kennt, der einen aufzeigt, dass in der Sahara versteinerte Wale liegen, wo selbst noch die Borsten vorhanden sind, was von einer riesigen Flut oder eher gesagt Schlammflug zeugt, mitten in der Wüste. Russland stand schon immer. Schaut euch mal diesen Palast an. Der wurde da nicht erst gebaut. Der stand im 17. Jahrhundert schon und wurde einfach nur besetzt. Most interesting are these photos from a South American city unknown to me. Especially in the last picture where the layer of earth on the right side becomes visible. In the meantime, the topic also finds its way into the mainstream, which usually means that it can no longer be kept secret. In a video, which has unfortunately been deleted, construction work in Moscow is reported in the course of which soil structures collapsed. The spokeswoman says that the foundation was thought to extend to a depth of 13 feet, but in fact, it was up to 60 feet. Yes, 60 feet. We see something similar in Salt Lake City. And here I took a little field trip to the Salt Lake Temple. I was just there recently and really remarkable what they've done this is typically the ground level up here above these guys. Maybe about 30 feet of dirt has been removed. This video about the Moscow Polytechnic Museum should convince even the biggest skeptic that something is not right here. It shows reconstruction works at the museum and gives deep insights from the inside and outside of the building. Of science on the basis of the Polytechnic Museum. Modernization of the museum is a large-scale state innovation project. The modernization program for 2017-2018. Picture. Well, all these pictures seem to have the same caption: reconstruction of the Polytechnic Museum. But we get some perspective from the main floor going down to the basement. And what's interesting to me is the I beams, which even seem to penetrate the brick columns. As to the technical details of how that's done, I can't quite figure it out. I just don't understand it at this point. Okay, so I will just tag this on to the end. I want to say that there is so much more to cover. This video shows a basement bar, quite obviously the former ground level.
that. <laughs> no. Meanwhile, the intrigue of free thinkers turns to the countless underground cities. Listen and be amazed. All big cities investigated so far have large tunnel systems. This raises the question of whether, when, how, and, above all, why our ancestors undermined their cities like moles, up to 26 feet deep. Are we possibly dealing with the former street level that has been submerged at some point in our history? Here we can see the underground area of Seattle, a city in the American West. I could go on like this forever, but let's get to the preliminary conclusion. There is no doubt that today's street level is between 5 to 18 feet higher than when all of these buildings were built originally. We generally see this in houses from the so-called German Grundzeit and the American Gilded Age circa 1870 to 1900. So the question arises, did a worldwide catastrophe take place in the 19th or 20th century, followed by subsequent repair work? If yes, then why don't we know anything about it? Or did it take place earlier, around 1600? As you may remember with the examples of the old city hall in Leipzig we discussed earlier, or did it happen several times? If so, these buildings would be much older than claimed, and our historiography would be a farce. Maybe the construction plans of these buildings, which can be found in the land registry, aren't construction plans, but only inventories. Did the actual builders and owners of these buildings perish in a catastrophic event? And did their descendants find the orphan cities and simply appropriate the buildings? This suggests we are looking at reset cities, a concept which we will discuss later. Countless photographs show deserted metropolises around 1840. Yes, this all sounds rather adventurous, I know. To question the writing of history alone would outrage many people. But what if, for some example, it was deliberately distorted in the course of re-education after 1945 in order to deprive the hated Germans of their past? Did the victors write history Literally, we still encounter many inconsistencies and therefore I would like to remind you of the motto of this series, namely, to think bigger and, above all, to think for yourself. Laziness and apathy are everywhere these days and this is, in my estimation, because people assume they know how things are, an assumption which is implanted in school. Many people think they know exactly how it was, which epoch followed which, and how we got here. In the end, it's all boring stuff. But what if we have been deceived, dulled, so that we don't look and think for ourselves? What if everything was completely different? Was there really a Gilded Age starting in 1870? Or are these buildings much older? Nothing is as it seems. Tourists walk through the cities in droves, busily snapping the sights. Ah, a Renaissance building built by King so-and-so in the year blah blah blah. Aha! So that's how it was. Ah, then everything is clear. Deeply satisfied to have learned something important again, it doesn't occur to us that the official narrative could be wrong. Isn't it strange that we've become quite alert 
when the car repair shop charges us $500 for a small repair, but otherwise accept uncritically what some authorities say. Yes, I too would never have thought that the dates on the pediments could lie. For example, that they could either be a deliberate deception or refer not to the construction of the house, but to its renovation. Look out for the weather vane of this building. Since I became aware of the mud flood issue, I have been taking a closer look for the first time and asking questions. For example, how long it actually takes to construct a building like the Leipzig Imperial Court, now the Federal Administrative Court. Are the six years from 1888 to 1895, as stated officially, sufficient for this? Or what about the then world-famous Singer Building at over 650 feet high? Supposedly, it was built in just two years, from 1906 to 1908, without machine assistance, of course, and including this extremely elaborate, masterful interior design. Really? Here you can see the Singer Building interior. The story of one building might still be possible. Maybe 1,000 workers did indeed spend day and night on the construction, as is said to have been the case at the Baltimore Estate. Even though, it is not quite clear to me how a 1,000 workers do not constantly get in each other's way and obstruct each other's work, but let's ignore that for the moment. However, if you take a look at all the construction activities that are said to have taken place in a city during a certain period, it quickly becomes absurd. Someone researched what happened in Seattle after the Great Fire of 1889. In a fantastic 18 months, 5,625 buildings are said to have been constructed there. That would be an impressive achievement even for a small row of houses, but we're talking about monsters like this. Probably the best video on such construction miracles is Mud Flood Mansions and the Gilded Age Deception by Conspiracy R Us, which I can only warmly recommend you to watch in full. The author shows how absurd the official narrative about the alleged construction is, including the suspicious demolition shortly after being built. What exactly is the Gilded Age? And when I was looking at... He also talks about the purpose of the fireplaces which were quite obviously not constructed or intended for the burning of wood. Well, if there was already a technology in the 19th century to heat these buildings without coal, oil or wood, and also to air condition them centrally, then it means one thing. We are not advanced at all but practically live in the Stone Age. All discussions about environmental pollution, oil shortage, etc. are absolutely redundant because almost certainly the elite circles know about this technology. So they keep us deliberately in ignorance as well as in a constant fight for survival. On the other hand, I'm annoyed at myself for believing all these cute stories and being so easily taken for a fool after all, allowing that to happen has a numbing effect on one's psyche. As we will soon see in this series, it is not without reason that we got to see so many Western movies when we were young, where they showed us cowboys and Indians. The so-called American frontier was, by no means, a wild west or an unsettled land, but home to a highly developed, now vanished culture. Compared to them, Today's fast food infested America looks like a Neander Valley populated by stupid barbarians.
These buildings have existed long before the Gilded Age started. It is unclear who built them. Both the dimensions and the furnishings speak of superior knowledge not available to the general public. The upper class today, the rich and powerful so admired by many, are the descendants of robbers and robber barons. They created the fairy tale of the Gilded Age, which in reality was the beginning of worldwide slavery of unparalleled proportions and still is today. In 1870, during the so-called Gilded Age, tall buildings supposedly appeared all over the world. But where did the billions of bricks and other needed materials come from? Was there a corresponding developed infrastructure in America, Europe and elsewhere? I have already discussed several buildings which are said to have been built during the building mania that suddenly broke out in 1870. Conclusion. Nonsense. The suspicion that we have been deceived here is further strengthened by the question of where the building material actually came from. Martin Leidke investigated this question here. I worked for Kaidu, which is Welsh Monuments, on National Monuments. I worked a lot with this and bath stone and other stone. But this granite is a bugger to work with, guys. It doesn't cut right, it's rock hard, it's god, it's heavy. Bridge. Then I went looking for the stone that produced all of this kit this kit that we see all over America, the, the mudflood buildings that are being talked about. The history of Hardwick granite built the nation. So Hardwick stone, Hardwick is a guy, he's an architect out of Britain actually from the 1800s, but his stone um, is basically in America and it's in a quarry um, in Vermont and it's a stone producing company in Vermont in a place called Hardwick. It is claimed, for example, that a single small quarry, namely the one in Hardwick, operated by a family business, had basically supplied the whole of America with granite. To get an idea of the scale, here is an excerpt from a list of buildings allegedly built with this granite. By the way, these are all buildings of sometimes gigantic dimensions, comparable to the Capitol in Washington. As if these contradictions were not enough, Wikipedia says that stone quarries were not operated in Hardwick, Vermont, until well after the end of the Civil War which lasted until 1865. In addition, the railroad, which shipped the granite, did not begin operation until 1888. But what material was used for the White House, which was already yellowed in this photograph from 1848? These inconsistencies have only come to light because many people have followed up on the matter after they became suspicious. Everything points to the fact that buildings like the Capitol, the Berlin Reichstag and all other so-called Gilded Age buildings are much older than is said today. Moreover, they all show the same mud flood characteristics. Well, our common sense assumes a continuity of records, especially with the thorough Germans. 
But wasn't Germany completely in ruins in 1945? Did only the land register archives remain intact while everything else was destroyed? Under the reign of Adolf Hitler, it is likely there was massive confiscation of buildings and perhaps also falsification of property deeds. With the Soviets, at least, this phenomenon was well documented. And who was responsible for writing history until around 1900? The church, right? Can we rely on the integrity of this power-obsessed institution? Then there's the objection that if there had been a mud flood or some other major catastrophe, it would be in the records or stories of our ancestors. I dare to doubt that because people like to repress such things from memory as we see this in many trauma victims. A protective memory loss occurs. Besides, as we will see, in the 19th century, millions of children were transplanted into new families, depriving them of their historical memory and roots. There is too much circumstantial evidence than can be explained with normal common sense. I'm afraid we'll have to think bigger. And much bigger to find any reasonably viable, explanatory approach to it all. At some point, probably before World War I, there must have been a break in the tradition, possibly due to a worldwide event that was not comprehensible at first. In one of the next videos, we will discuss the phenomenon of deserted cities around 1840, which suggests that there must have been some kind of reset or restart. Cities like St. Petersburg, Moscow, Washington and even Berlin are deserted in photographs from this period. Were they repopulated and the then ruling authorities simply pasted matching dates all over them and voila, we had a new historical continuity. As alluded to in the first part, many buildings, like the Biltmore Estate, were not only built in record time, but also demolished right away after only 20 or 30 years, like this beautiful building. I also find it significant that there are no photos of the construction of these magnificent buildings, although they were regularly photographed from 1840 onwards. Often, only the final state of the building is documented. The very few pictures that supposedly show a construction phase could just as well be showing the renovation, because the masonry mostly looks old. Photograph montages cannot be ruled out either. Usually people are naturally proud and would document every part of the building process, including the laying of the foundation stone, but we don't see such photos. Every simple building has a media hype today celebrating the building process, but there was none when the ostensible Mr. Vanderbilt built a grandiose estate for himself, drawing on the best available artists. Not very credible, I think. Because one looks on the foreign countries usually more neutrally, we will now focus on the United States of America. What kind of media, implanted image, do we have of this nation and its past? Endless expanses and smoking colts, wooden saloons and vast herds of buffalo, right? Immigrants from Europe, threatened by starvation, building something brand new from scratch, then cut! And we're in the 60s. Rock and roll, baby! But what was in between? And what before? Get ready for something. Why does Chicago, after the 1871 fire, look like California in 2016 after the fires? Or like Manhattan after 9-11? And why weren't the buildings made of wood, as we are told? According to today's opinion, these cities in the Gilded Age style, like Berlin, Paris or London, with their massive stone structures and representative buildings, did not exist until 1870. Before that, most houses were made of wood, so they say, and therefore it is not surprising 
that under unfavorable conditions, whole cities could burn down. This is also said, for example, about Chicago, where in 1871, when the German Empire was founded, a cow caused a devastating fire. One dark night when we were all in bed, Old Mother Leary left a lantern in the shed, and when the cow kicked it over, she winked her eye and said, There'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. Fire, fire, fire! A lamp falls down, a city burns down. Makes sense. We also get the valuable information from a Chicago news outlet that possibly blame did not fall on the farmer's wife, Mrs. O'Leary, but on her neighbors after coming home from a party. That is truly a profound contribution to education. On the German, as well as English Wikipedia site, we read that extremely unfavorable circumstances coincided, like a hot summer, understaffed fire department, etc. Apparently, similarly unfavorable as with 9-11, where the entire air defense was ignorant. Now, how come in the same article we don't see charred debris at all? But get these pictures. But Pittsburgh, where a fire raged in 1845, was also apparently built in stone. This raises a lot of questions. Obviously, we are dealing with large cities made of stone, which should not have existed there, however, in America in 1870, at the beginning of the Gilded Age, especially not in 1845. The official explanation of the cause of the fire is a lie, because stone buildings do not simply catch fire. Furthermore, a fire is not able to crumble buildings downright, as you can see on the pictures. Signs of fire are not visible either. Therefore, once again, the official explanation cannot be true. Real fires leave the following traces. Walls do not collapse so easily, nor do they vanish into thin air. For comparison, look at the pictures of Chicago. Let's note that even back then, there must have been complete cities in the so-called Gilded Renaissance style. Who built them and created the necessary infrastructure beforehand, i.e. firing billions of bricks, etc.? A normal fire certainly did not cause this destruction. What then? Let's look at the pictures of the fires in California, 2016 for comparison, as well as the destruction of the World Trade Center in Manhattan. Do you see the parallels? Like in Chicago, there are no mountains of debris piling up, and the trees are intact too. Highly interesting is that we find exactly the same traces of complete obliteration after the alleged earthquake and fires in San Francisco of 1906, among others. Everything is gone. As in California today, or in the forest fires in Greece, Australia, Portugal, from drone footage, etc. By the way, isn't the resolution of the original San Francisco photo amazing? High definition in 1906. The first cameras did provide high resolution images, but each shot had to be exposed for a long time, which in turn requires a still location. But the photo above is an aerial shot. Where did all the world's fairs go? Who built them in such a short time? Why did they all burn down and by what kind of fire?
It is clear at this point that there is something wrong with the Gilded Age from 1870 onwards, and this is because there is no historical mention of a worldwide catastrophe in the last 200 years, which we call the Mud Flood. Already in 1840, big cities made of massive and durable stone buildings existed everywhere, for example in the United States, which were moreover raised to the ground by fires that left trees intact, but literally pulverized stone and metal, just like what we see with 9-11 and the recent California fires. With the motive of this video in mind, namely to wake up to reality in order to become capable of action, let us dig deeper. To learn that there was a fire in Chicago in 1871 is certainly not particularly spectacular. That unknown forces must have been at work here, literally wiping out entire neighborhoods, makes it more exciting. It becomes electrifying when we consider the number of these fires. Not one city was incinerated, not two, but dozens and dozens, almost at the same time. Diligent people further found out that on the same night that Chicago burned, several other American cities also fell victim to devastating fires. This is discussed in the video by Conspiracy R Us, which is worth watching in full. At the same time that the Chicago fire was raging, which was on a, a Sunday night around 9 p.m., you have this whole region in flames. And actually, this is considered the greatest, uh, the worst fire in American history. I didn't even know on the same day as the Chicago fire, there was other fires. I had no idea. And not only were there other fires, but it was like the greatest uh, the worst fire in United States history happened that day, and no one knows about it. And a fire associated with that happened in the city I grew up in, and I didn't even know about it. So, ah, weird times, weird times. But I just kind of wanted to point this out, that these comets, they do seem to have these electrical phenomena associated with them. And uh, it's interesting how the official narrative, you know, isn't even tying all these fires together. And it's almost completely forgetting about this fire. Um, so I just, I think I'll leave it there, but uh, that's it till next time. Thanks for watching, bye. It is clear that behind the ridiculous explanations like the cow that burned down the city, great catastrophes with mysterious aspects are hidden. Abysses open up, from which many surely shy away, and therefore prefer to believe the official version. It is similar to the image of the dusty wild west that has been hammered into us in countless westerns, with friendly farmers saved from evil villains by brave sheriffs. It doesn't get more black and white than this clown show. Granted, there may well have been a period when everything in America was dusty and deserted, see the mud flood. But otherwise, amazing things were happening there and elsewhere. I'm referring to the World Fairs. Only 21 years after the fire, which certainly took an extreme economic toll on Chicago, we see these buildings there at the Columbia World Exposition. Doesn't it somehow make you feel like you're dreaming? This is supposed to be America. Even more astonishing is the fact that the exhibition closed its doors only one year after the opening. Just like that. Shortly after, there was another fire, which destroyed most of the buildings. Well, what do you know? But such world exhibitions were not just a local whim of rich and wealthy people. In fact, we find them all around the world. For example, in London as early as 1851. Or in Paris in 1867.
Vienna, 1873. Philadelphia, 1876. As in Seattle, it seems fairies magically built San Francisco, and only 11 years after the fire that almost wiped out the entire city, the Panama Pacific Expo enchanted its visitors. As for Chicago, there was also a fire there. Part of the British, Martin speaking. Okay, so I find this out and I'll go back to some more photos. San Francisco earthquake, I don't want to read the official narratives, I'm just going to touch upon what they say, okay? Massive earthquake shook San Francisco, right, on the 25th of August, um, sorry. Um, on the morning of April the 18th, 1906. Okay. Um, cities in America on fire. Um, I don't know exactly what's going on. Aftermath of the Great Fire of 1901. Before researching these topics, I only knew of the Paris World's Fair of 1900, where they built the Eiffel Tower. It was the only one left of all the fantastic buildings that had been built there especially for the exhibition. Everything else was apparently torn down afterwards and disappeared as if never having existed. Isn't that strange? The following video shows how many incredibly magnificent exhibitions there were around the world and also their destruction. The video is from the Age of Disclosure channel, which has since been deleted. As an aside, one may wonder what kind of fire we are dealing with that, once again, could harm all the steel and glass in the Crystal Palaces. Incidentally, there was also a Crystal Palace in my adopted hometown of Leipzig, of the same style as everywhere else, and it disappeared just as soundlessly 